Well, everybody, thanks so much for listening to us. If you're listening to us for the first time, please subscribe and definitely share this interview. We have a returning guest. This is his fourth, fifth, maybe sixth time. Who the hell knows? Who cares? <laughs> but he, we bring him back because he is amazing on the issues and most of the people agree with them. There's a couple that not that don't, but I, you know, in fact, Darius, I asked the people that don't agree with you to come on the show and participate in the call here, and they refuse to do so. Maybe they're a little scared and they're a little bashful, <laughs> but but that's part for the, that's part for the course. One day, maybe they'll put their big boy pants on and come on here, and, and go, we can go back and forth. But this is Darius Ross. Uh, and Darius, first of all, thanks so much. You have so many credentials in real estate and the stock market and economics in general. We really appreciate you coming on and speaking with us as you always have and always do. And we'll continue to bring you on. So thanks so much. My pleasure, Rob. I appreciate it. There's going to be a huge, you know, I shouldn't even say there's going to be. There already is a huge homeless crisis in this country right now, along with the debt crisis, along with the COVID, the supply chain, the inflation crisis. It brings us back to, as history buffs like we are, it brings us back to that serfs, you know, that we are serving the rich 1%. And that's what it's going to be, minimum wage, low wage jobs. And you're fighting to get the best job that pays the best. And that seems like what's going on right now. But it's going to be the peasants and the serfs. We're going back to middle evil times, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. For every one person, there's at least 10 jobs right now. So that's the reality check. Now let's take it a step further. Like I said earlier, 70% on the average between 50 and 75, we'll say, of the wealth in the world is controlled by that 0.1% or 10% of the population. So if we look at that into you know, the numbers game, what happened over the last 10 years, especially on Wall Street, were the buybacks. Most of those company stocks were bought back with the, the free money, if you want to call it that, the money that was put in circulation by the Fed. So now the problem you have here is you have a population of young people that are probably under the age of 40. And they're saying, hey, the CEO of X, Y, and Z company made 100 million. The CEO of this company made 100 million. Why am I working? I'm making nothing. And he made hundreds of millions of dollars. They don't want to work because they're tired of being, quote unquote, being felt as if they're peasants or slaves. So they're not going to. So this great reset is probably going to last for the next decade. It has a lot to do with the fact that I'll now go back to history for a moment. There was a point in time when things like the Rob Report, the DuPont Registry, and all these magazines that were showcasing wealth and power, that was not in the hands of everybody. But when we created this influencing community where you had TikTok and Instagram and so forth, everybody saw what it was like to live a certain way and you could become an influencer and make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Now that is the life. So now nobody wants to turn around and live regularly because the normal Joe Schmo was having a vacation, he may have had a wife, he may have had kids, and he had a regular house. Now everybody wants to live a certain lifestyle. That's the problem. That was not not designed for everybody, but now the exposure to it has led people to say to themselves, I don't wanna live like this. I don't wanna live regular. I want the best of the best. So this thing called the American dream left the basics to the phenomenal fantastic, and now everybody wants to be. So we're never going back there again. That just means a complete reset in the world. But you said in a previous podcast that this is going to lead to a right-wing reset, not a left-wing mm -hmm. reset. Why, why do you say that? In order for this thing to actually come back to normality, it's going to cause a, the kind of devastation that happened in the 1920s, 29, through probably 38, 39. Ten years of massive unemployment, massive amount of uh, folks that will be homeless, uh, job crisis. Businesses closing up, as you see here in New York and other places in the country, that will be an ongoing thing for a decade, at least, to come, as well as, you know, boarded up homes. Once that takes place, and the reality check of it is, I have to go back to my normal life, and we can call it serfdom, we can call it slavery, whatever you want to call it, but they're going to go back to normal. But it's going to be because of a lot of pain that they have to go through to get there. So that right-wing experience is going to be just that. The folks are going to rebel about it. They're going to fight about it. There's going to be all kind of crimes that you see going on now, sporadically, and then it will come to a screeching halt. You remember, there was this big thing about the march on Wall Street. Notice how quickly that ended. 
Yeah. When the reality check set in. Uh, the reset's already taken place in New York mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. A lot of these big skyline buildings that are empty right now, mm -hmm. more to come as the years go on. You know, how is this going to affect the city in general? Crime is up there. It's a huge problem. The mayor is Mr. Flashy, <laughs> and he's running around there. The mayor before that wasn't any better. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like, again, bad to worse. Mm -hmm. uh, as we see in New York politics. So can you talk about that, about how all these empty buildings, what's going to happen with them? Because are they just going to be just empty buildings for show or movies? You're going to have a tremendous amount of buildings that are going to be basically mothball for a while until those buildings become basically uh, apartment complexes. They will be converted, ultimately speaking, to housing in the inner city. So you're going to have a massive influx of people coming into the inner city from outside the suburban areas because it's going to become too expensive to live out there. Not to say there's going to be any less expensive in the city because New York City, technically speaking right now, has a very low housing rate of vacancies. But that's going to get tremendously worse when it comes down to the cost of everything because, strangely enough, as bad as it seems to be getting now, the cost of a one-bedroom is $3,000. A two-bedroom is upward to 5000 to It could be as high as ten. So the reality check of it is these buildings are going to be converted. You're going to see the inner city continue to have some sort of crime situation that's going to get you know worse and worse until, this is the key, until you have a situation where you have the have and the have-nots. When more of the haves are in the inner city, that's going to push for a strong mayor like a Mayor Bloomberg at the time or some of the other mayors that have been some of the cities that have pushed for a real hard stamp down on crime. But then that in itself is going to create some problems. So we can look for these mayors that will be coming in the next, say, 10 years are going to be tough, get tough mayors, you know, more of a military town situation in these cities. But the haves are going to push the have nots out. And that's going to create a situation where financially speaking, in order to live in the average inner city in America, you're going to have to make at least one fifty two hundred thousand. That's a reality check. But is it worse to as far as financially to live in San Francisco than New York? I heard it's more expensive to live in San Francisco. Absolutely. It's yeah. going to be tied. It's going to be tied. You're going to see the cost of living in San Francisco, the cost of living in Chicago, the cost of living in Miami is relatively going to be the same. So no matter where you go in this country, mm -hmm. if you're going to an inner city, you can expect that you're going to have to lease $150,000, dollars is going to be the average cost to live there just to pay $60,000 of rent per year. See, people haven't thought about that. That's 60000 a year to just stay in an apartment. And that's a studio. <laughs> okay? Oh, Reality check. With three people. With three people. It's crazy. Oh, the 1% might con control a lot of this money. But mm -hmm. for them to make money, you know, they're going to need these the little people to work. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to need the little people to buy their products. So how is all that going to play out if people have less money? And they can't buy these expensive products because of inflation, because they don't have a job that they can pay for these expensive products. I even look at Disney. I know we've talked about Disney before in these podcasts, mm -hmm. but Disney made $3.8 billion in profit last quarter. They keep raising the annual passes. They keep raising the, the regular tickets. They, they raise the, the passes if you want to go into the fast pass. Every time you go in there, you're going to pay 15 bucks for one ride. And it's starting to get out of control there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it just going to be these places like Disney, these big corporations that make expensive cars and expensive items, that it's just going to be the only way people are going to pay for this is if they're rich. And if they're not, then they can't buy it. But that's going to end up hurting the person that's producing these products. See, here's a tricky part now. You have the U.S. billionaire community and those that are wealthy. In this country, over the last, say, three or four years, have produced $400 billion of new wealth, right? Yeah. And here's the trick to it. If you have no other choice, and this is the thing that is learned in the inner city, especially in the African-American community, Hispanic communities, and so forth, if there's only one shop to go to, and that bodega is all you have left, and the bodega is basically a uh, corner store. If you have another place to go to, you don't have a choice. You have to pay the prices. Until such time, somebody decides to open up and becomes competitive. So basically, these people are going to be driven to one or two things. Either A, 
is going to get to the point where they can't afford to go any further because greed has pushed it so far that they can't do anything else or they're just going to live to exist. It's going to be rent, paying a new car payment because you got to have the car to get to the job. The jobs are further and further out. So it's the rent, the car payment. Maybe you can buy some food to exist and that's it. That's the reality. All the non-essential things are going to go out the window until such time that, you know, the top of the food chain realize that just as you say it, in order for, if we look at the top of the food chain being the, the seat of the chair and there's legs, if you start breaking off the legs, which is the middle class, you start breaking off the upper middle class, you start breaking off the poor that keeps everybody supported, you can't keep this thing going. So this pyramid is going to eventually come crashing down at some point in time. Probably we're going to wake up one Wednesday or one Saturday or Sunday morning and the market takes a tumble and everybody takes a hit and this has to all start over again. But you cannot continue to keep this thing going at this level because the people that need to make things happen can't. They can't afford a $400 uh, laundry bill. They can't afford $200 worth of grocery every single week. It's not going to happen. What, what do you think the reason why this crime wave has gotten us so out of control? There's two issues going on here. It goes back to one, greed, and two, it goes back to something that is called the instability of the system. See, here's the thing. Once you start draining all the money out of the system, you're at the top of the food chain and you start dragging everything out. You don't leave room for the folks at the bottom to breathe. Okay, for example, there was this thing that's called ASEAN money, which is old money and Novel money, Nuvirishk. Okay, so in the new money, it's been like, okay, I got mine, forget you. In the days of the Fords, the DuPonts and the Rockefellers, there was a concept of, they allowed for, and I shouldn't say the word, but we'll call it that. They allowed for the fact that the common man had to exist. He had to have his car. He had to have his food. He had to exist. He had to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. That whole thing is gone now. Now it's like, okay, I got mine. I don't care if you get yours. You've got to buy my product. You've got to take this price increase. You have to take this hit. That's the problem. It's the greed. It has very little to do necessarily with the politicians. They're just endorsing the greed because they're being basically put in a position to endorse the greed. Darius A. Ross, DariusARoss.com. Definitely check it out. You know, I want to talk about the new money. You talk about cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. I, I was just interviewing a real estate agent, and we'll address her in just a second. But uh, she told me, first of all, that her she's in Los Angeles, and there's people going up to her with crypto, and they're buying huge houses, mm -hmm. millions of dollars, a lot of young kids. They're in their 20s, early 20s, maybe late 20s, but mostly around that age range where they got into the crypto game and they're crushing it. Can you tell the people that are listening to this broadcast a little bit about cryptocurrency, why you feel like the young kids are crushing it, and how long is this going to last for them? You have a situation where you have something that's basically has a lack of instability. You know, how do you maintain a currency? that's a deviation from the US dollar. That's the big thing. And those of us that are old school, we consider that are over 50, we say that cryptocurrency is a thing of the future. We're not just there yet for it to be stable because of how it has to be based upon, but, but you're looking at digital currency, which basically there is no stopping, there is no ending, there is no possession. Nobody really has possession of this currency. Mm -hmm. So there is no way to basically say where it began it, where does it end, and basically police it, okay? That's the real issue. And as a result, it's distributed ledger. And to make it all simple, it's like saying, okay, well, I have X amount of dollars. It's not backed by anything necessarily, but it is, as they use the term, mined. So, okay, fine. So you have this currency and it's an alternative currency. And what it does is provide another way to pay for whatever you want to pay for without it being disrupted by the authorities, without it being disrupted by banks and institutions. But here's the problem. It's all based upon how much people see a desire for it. And right now, there are institutions, even including some of the investment banks, that are getting into it. The problem becomes, how long does this thing take before it becomes mainstream? I'm saying we're at least five to 10 years out. But right now, for those that are embracing it, it is doing wonderfully well. Okay. 
and thank you for clarifying that because there's a lot of people that don't know much about crypto and how it works in general. I, I want to go into these last few questions again. Darius A. Ross, DariusARoss.com. Definitely check it out. Talking about the housing market, as I just said in the last question, I was talking to a real estate agent that works worked with Michael Jackson. She's worked mm -hmm. with many you know, very wealthy celebrities in general and people that have lots of money buying these big houses in Los Angeles. And she disagreed with what you said as far as the housing market mm -hmm. taking a tumble dive. I don't agree with that either. I've talked to a couple of people that say mm -hmm. they don't agree with that either. Mm -hmm. They think that it's going to take a dive, like you said, like I agree mm -hmm. with you saying, and many other people agree with that. Why do you feel, do you feel like, and, you know, we're not trying to go against this woman that's a real estate agent, but uh, do you feel like somebody that says that, that's a real estate agent, maybe that's dealing with all these high profile celebrities, maybe they're out of touch that they're not seeing what's going on in the real estate market, that they don't believe there's a crash going to happen in 2022? Here's the uh, unique thing about it, whether it's 2022 or 2025, we have bubbles of all bubbles stocks, commodities, securities, derivatives, and so forth. But let's deal with the real estate market. The real estate market has never increased at clips of 20, 40, 50%. It's always been between two and 6% on the average. When I say clip, percentage increase, okay? So, okay, you got a million dollar house. Maybe the house increases 2%, okay? Maybe 4%, maybe 6%, not 50%, not 100%. So right. now you have houses that somebody is buying at a million bucks and now they're selling it back at five million. It didn't happen. Historically speaking, it's never happened. Now folks will say, well, that was old history. So you're the old time and you're from the old school. No, real estate is something that increases based upon time. That's why you buy it. You buy it for the long term. You buy multifamily housing for the long term. Let's look at luxury housing. There are only so many millionaires in this country. And as maybe we've got about 100,000 to 300,000 here in New York and maybe 10 million countrywide. So we have 10 million countrywide that have networks of a million or more, okay? So that's 10 million out of 390 some million people. We have millions of multi-million dollar houses. Not everybody wants to buy that house just because your net worth is a million. I mean, you're buying a million dollar house. Your next door neighbor at Robert Kiyosaki's book said it best. Not everybody that has a million bucks is buying a million bucks house. So what she's saying is, I would agree with if we had a situation where this next generation, when we look at the generational wealth transference, there's 70, 80 trillion dollars is going to transfer. But those kids that are my son's age was in their 30s and 20s, those kids are not in a position to buy a million dollar house. So what she's saying is, okay, maybe those of my generation, the 50s, maybe they can buy one, right? But once we get to mid 60s, early 70s, we're not buying another million dollar house. We can't afford the upkeep because we're looking at how to sustain the wealth. So having said that, real estate is not going to continue to increase the way it is now. As a matter of fact, you figure a 40 to 60 percent drop, guarantee you, within the next five years. With that being said, yes, million dollar houses are still going to be million dollars. But how long do you sit on it? Michael Jordan has a house right now that's in Chicago that has been sitting for almost 10 years. And I can think of a number of other high celebrity houses that are still sitting that can't be sold because it was designed to that person's taste. you got a swimming pool. you got this. you got that. Not everybody wants that stuff. Well, let me throw something else in there, too, that people need to understand as far as his audience is concerned. When you look at buying a house, you're not buying an asset that's producing income. You're buying something for your pleasure to stay in. Notice what I said, your pleasure to stay in. It is not producing income. So if you're buying a multifamily house, a three, 10, or 20 unit, that's producing income because somebody has to pay to stay there. You're paying for upkeep, maintenance, and taxes. That's not an asset. That's a depreciating liability. Folks need to understand that you're buying the house to stay in for your own pleasure for 10 or 20 or 30 years or for life. You are not buying an asset to stay long-term. So you buy these million-dollar houses, it does not produce income. Sorry, folks. Agreed 100%. Last three questions. Again, Darius A. Ross, DariusARoss.com. Definitely check them out. I was just reading an article in the Palm Beach Post uh, yesterday, I believe, and it talked about all the people that were moving into Florida throughout 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, the top of the list was New York and New mm -hmm. Jersey moving down to Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, that changes voting as far as that goes and 
It might help Democrats, might not, <laughs> depending mm-hmm. on, you know, what sh- uh, people were moving into uh, from New York to Florida. Uh, there was also Illinois people that were moving into Florida, mm-hmm. California people, which mm-hmm. I was really surprised to see. Not many, mm-hmm. only at like a 1900, but it was up 51% as far mm-hmm. as people moving from California to Florida. Uh, and then foreign people uh, was up pretty mm-hmm. high. Uh, about 40% of the people that moved in were from foreign country, which I was... Uh, Latin that America, was kinda, big thing. Yeah, that was kind of interesting too. Mm-hmm. Uh, regardless, uh, New York was the highest one. Mm-hmm. So how is this going to hurt the state of New York with all these people? That was only for one year. You know, it was about 65,000 people moving from New York to Florida in one year. And how is that going to hurt the state? It's the content of the people that are moving. How many of those folks were high income? How many of those folks were major taxpayers? How many of those were business owners? And or how many of those were individuals that actually made a significant impact on the economy? So to answer that question, probably 60% of them based upon the fact that they had the means to go to Florida and to buy a house, to rent a condominium, to rent an apartment and so forth. So New York will take a tremendous hit from that, particularly speaking when you look at the whole crime issue. A lot of higher income condominiums and co-ops here are now also sitting vacant because those owners now have left and went to Florida or they've went to New Jersey or they went overseas even. So that's tremendous hit. So those folks are in the million dollar category. I, I just want, and I agree with you 100%, but I just want to state the facts here. The first county these people were moving to from New York to Florida was Palm Beach County. Mm-hmm. Second was Orange County, which mm-hmm. is Orlando. Third mm-hmm. was Miami Dade. Mm-hmm. Fourth was Hillsborough, which is Tampa. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing those main metropolitan areas of Florida get mm-hmm. swamped with the people from New York, New Jersey, Illinois. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was also Wisconsin in there. And like I said, California was also in there too. What do you think about these interest rates? When are they slowly starting to inch up? We see the mortgage rate is starting to go up for that fixed mortgage. 30 years is starting to go up a little bit more. Um, I don't know if that's a good sign if you want to put money in the bank or a bad sign. What is your opinion on all this interest rates, the mortgage rate, all that stuff? You're looking at mortgage rates now around 4%. Now, let me take you back in history, and I'm old enough to remember this. My parents bought a house, the interest rates were between 9 and 12%. So those that were born after 1985 are looking at me probably right now going, what did he just say? Yes, yeah. interest rates in the 1970s per Mr. Reagan, President Reagan, that is, timetable was between 9 and 12%. Now, for those that don't understand what that means is that you were buying a lot less house for a lot less money at the time, but you were still paying through the nose. Okay, because at that time, my parents were paying $236 for a mortgage, but $236 was basically two weeks pay. So we have to remember this. So now what we're looking at right now is that I would say this year, the Federal Reserve is going to make at least seven different interest rate increases, seven, count them. Okay, so we can look at interest rates now probably heading towards seven, eight percent. And probably by 2025, we could be upwards if they want to get inflation under control. High as 14%, higher than it was in the 1970s, because now you have to rein in all this money. So how do you bring all this money back home? You have to turn around and create a crisis. So what is going to be the crisis? A stock market reset, otherwise known as a crash. Yeah. Yeah. And you say this is going to happen within the next two or three years then, correct? No, later than 2025, but I'm more opinion of between now and the end of the year. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens. (laughs) I know you said that about the Kamala Harris. Go ahead. You're starting to see now with these point drops, 500 points here, 1,000 points here, 500 points here. These are all precursors. It's precursors to we wake up one Wednesday, we wake up one Monday morning, and it's like what happened with Lehman Brothers in the uh, 2007-8 situation. It's like no shit moment. That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen all of a sudden. Okay. So if you're in the stock market, what advice would you give to somebody right now? Position yourself in cash and then wait for the otherwise known as the crocodiles in the water and take advantage of the um, price 
drop and wait until it kind of bottoms out to the fact that let's say you got a market where uh, stocks are trading at 100. If you see it down around 15 to 20 dollars, yeah, you can jump back in. But again, be cash liquid and be prepared to take advantage of the dip. But the dip is going to be a long dip and it's going to be a climb back up. It's going to take a while. Now, one quick point, I will say this, probably by 2030, maybe 2040, we can probably see the stock market at close to 100,000. Wow. Let me ask you this, you know, last question, you know, we've talked about this many times. I know you're putting your money behind Kamala Harris for 2024 mm -hmm. to be president. I still think that's insane, but we can disagree on one thing and we'll, we'll disagree on that. Are you still in that boat? Absolutely. Okay. I'd say she is going to be president, guarantee. And this is the reasoning why. This economic upheaval is going to provide the headwinds that she needs to position herself accordingly. The thing of it is, is timing. See, sometimes I have this new book I'm writing now, Timing, Synchronicity, and Precision, TPS. Right now, the timing is such that financially speaking, the world is kind of playing with the numbers game. The precision of it all is all she has to do is just sit tight and be patient. And the synchronicity of it is if everything comes together, the economic crisis, people looking at their pocketbooks, the impact, and if the Republicans don't really produce a name brand person, she's there. Okay, but what about Trump? Non-existent, not even an issue. Okay. Not even an issue. We'll see what happens. He's kind uh, of go he's kind of grabbing for straws. I'll say it that way right now. Okay. His star has come and gone. Okay, we'll see what happens. Uh, twenty twenty two, still a bloodbath for the Democrats. Yeah, I'm afraid so because primarily, like I said, right now that's why so many uh, Democrats are now positioning retiring. themselves to get out and retiring because they don't want to be part of the fiasco there. But this is the problem with the Republicans. Once you win in the midterms, now you have to play this game out. So you have to not only win, but you have to produce a body that can win in 2024. That's the hardest part, because just because you're in lockstep, and even as a Republican speaking this, you know, on the record, you can be in lockstep. That does not mean you can produce a candidate to win. All the Democrats have to do is not screw up. You have to produce somebody that can win. Okay, just just to disagree, uh, Ron DeSantis or Trump, I think would, could be Kamala Harris personally. Okay, you disagree still though? Absolutely, because again, <laughs> okay, the party. This is the thing: the party has to agree on the program. I don't think the Republican Party can keep all constituents together for another two years to agree on being able to put either one of those gentlemen in office. They have to still agree upon one of the two. And because of the fact the two of them don't necessarily agree with each other when it right. comes down to egos. See, that's the problem. It's egos. Can their egos actually calm down enough to let one of them be in office or do they have to fight each other? That would, DeSantis would have to take the back seat. Because mm -hmm. Trump's, yeah, <laughs> Trump's not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And DeSantis would have to do. Yeah, I agree. I don't see it happening either. I think mm -hmm. for sure he's going to run. And the only reason, the only way that he would not run is that obviously if he lost in 2022 mm -hmm. and the candidates, again, I'll be voting in that election. The candidates mm -hmm. <laughs> that they have up on the Democratic side are very, very weak. We'll just mm -hmm. say to say it nicely. Anyways, as we come to the end, Darius, what do you hope people learn from our conversation today? Uh, to get an idea of the fact that we are in an economy that basically is very fragile and to position themselves accordingly. It's not necessarily a scare tactic, but to position yourself accordingly to realize that we are at a fragile moment in history. And circa 1929, folks did not see that before 29 happened that we were in the glory days, right? And those eight years before 29 was fantastic. So I want to make sure people understand, position yourself accordingly and be prepared for upheaval and uh, whether you can weather the storm, which basically means position your pocket where you're not heavily in debt. 
so you can weather the storm because there will be a storm and it'll be quite costly one. I agree 100%. Darius A. Ross, DariusARoss.com. Darius, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Bob. Take care.